Hello, and welcome to the Skating Lesson Podcast, where we interview influential people from the world of figure skating so they can share with us the lessons they learned along the way. I'm Jennifer Kirk, a former U.S. Ladies competitor and a three-time world team member. I'm David Lees. I was never on the world team. I'm a far cry from that pewter medal, but I am a figure skating blogger and a current adult skater. This week, we had a few technical issues that were so We sad. had boot problems. <laughs> boot problems. Type of boot would problems. Hit us. Uh. We had some technical issues, so we can only give you guys the audio portion of our interview with our guest this week, Rudy Galindo, but thank you for hanging with us, and we're going to try to come back next week with a stronger interview where you can actually see our guest in addition to hearing him or her. Well, this week we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Rudy Galindo to the show. Rudy Galindo is best known for being the 1996 U.S. National Champion. He was a pro skater for many years in about every competition known to man. He was on Champions on Ice for well over a decade. And he was also a two-time U.S. National Champion in pairs with Christy Yamaguchi. And it should be noted, Dave and I did a lot of research prior to this interview. Dave speed read it was amazing Rudy's book in a night and a half in between his lunch break and his this or that it was, it was kind of impressive and I of course watched a bunch of Rudy's tapes and we both researched a bunch of articles and we went into this interview really with one impression of Rudy and I think perhaps it wasn't an accurate per- perception yeah I think looking back on my image of Rudy as a child uh, you know, Rudy really came to the forefront in the mid nineties. I believe I was about 10 at the time. And the story was all about Rudy being the first openly gay male American skater and, you know, and how he was the champion for, you know, being gay and self-acceptance. And I'm, I, I'm curious to know what the uh, viewers and the listeners are going to think, but I'm wondering if maybe Rudy was created to tell more of a story and that the media almost use Rudy to tell their own narrative. And while I think he is very proud of who he is and very appreciative, and I think you're going to really enjoy listening to Rudy, I'm left wondering if perhaps some of the narrative about Rudy was a little bit more created um, by agents or handlers than from Rudy himself. Yeah, and we should note, we really enjoyed talking to Rudy. We enjoyed this interview. And again... Thank you for being patient with us with some of, some of our technical issues, and hopefully you guys will enjoy the interview. So, Rudy, thank you so yep. much for being here. We're so happy to have you. It's nice to be here. Congratulations. You're going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, Nationals, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Correct. So exciting. So, I just want to start off by saying that Dave and I, we're such huge fans of your skating. You're just such a great performer. I think we're both fans of your professional career, particularly, and I think you always came up with the most unique and innovative programs. One year, you dressed as a clown. Another year, you were, I think you were like a violin and your arms were the strings. And then who could forget your Village People program? So I'm wondering, how did you come up with such unique and innovative show programs? Uh, What year did we tour? Was I doing Santa the Clowns? Um, No, we toured 2004, 2005 season. 2004. What, what did I do that year? Did I do YMCA? I think you did it one year, yeah. I think one year. Oh, okay. Um, how do I come up with that? You know, the, the YMCA, um, I just remember it was just like a, um, um, Tommy Collins wanted a, a fast, upbeat number. Mm-hmm. He said, just come with a fast, upbeat number and stuff. And so I just thought, you know, I was just listening to music and, you know, I just thought, oh my God, the village people, you know, the the gay <laughs> the gay group, you know, in the right. 80s and stuff. And I thought it was fun, you know. So, of course, you know, the YMCA and the in the Navy. So I had I did a medley of it. And I'm like, okay, you know, I could start out with a, a Navy costume and then strip down to, like, um, YMCA, you know, something fun, like an old-fashioned bathing suit type mm-hmm. thing. Would you try yeah. to outdo yourself and become more outrageous? Or? Um, yeah, I was kind of, yeah, the, like, undertone, you know, just... Like some of the arm movements and stuff when, you know, did the YMCA and, you know, because I was comfortable for, for who I was and, and, well, who I am, <laughs> who I was, and um, <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> no. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I just thought it would be fun to play on my um, sexuality and, you know, and make fun of the group and, you know, and just have fun. Well, the audience definitely always liked you. And where did you get those fun sober pants? We love those. Which, oh yeah, what year, what did I skate to that year? At the World Pro, you did Dancing With Myself, and you wore those That's silver. That's right. 
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dancing with Myself, Billy Idol. So where uh, did you find the pants? Where did I find the pants? You know, I think it was in either West Hollywood or in the Castro, of course. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> a lot of my shirts and stuff I got in like West Hollywood in the gay area or the Castro. Okay. So we have like a really fun time imagining you coaching. So what are you like as a coach? Are you a strict coach? No, like, you know what? I'm, I'm a fun coach. I remember when I started, like I was a part-time coach for about 15 years now and I've been full-time coach for about seven. And I remember like, Probably the second year into my full time coaching, they were they were talking about some of the LA coaches. They would go to LA for a week and stuff. I'd set them up with lessons, and they said, "Oh my God, it's certain coaches are so strict and mean, and they get the kids to do stuff." And they said, "You know, why don't you be um, strict with our kids?" Because I was kind of fun loving and stuff. Because I hated being taught by a coach that was screaming and you know top of the lungs. I just rebelled, you know, and so. Then I started getting angry at them, you know, just like, you know, if they weren't doing jumps and, you know, kind of raising my voice. And then finally the parents were like, oh, mm, we like you the other way. We like you the nice Rudy, you know. And, and I think that just works for me because all my coaches, um, from Colleen Blackmore, she was really strict. She was my first coach and she taught me all the basics and she was amazing. But she had me in tears every day. And then when I had, went to my second coach, Jim Hewlett, um, he was just so laid back and just calm. And then my uh, third coach, when he passed away, uh, Rick Inglacy, um, was a very uh, calm uh, coach. And then uh, he died. And then when I went to singles, I, I took from a trial run with, um, I don't want to name any names of uh, coaches, but I tried um, these two coaches. They team taught together. And I was 25 years old, and they were – I took from them about six months and um, they were screaming on top of their lungs. And I was training my programs and, and em embarrassing me and just yelling at me. They would walk off um, at internationals. They would walk off um, practice sessions. If I missed like one jump or something, they'd leave the stands. And I'm like, this, I don't need this, you know, and I didn't like that. So my sister said, just finish out the year with them and, and we'll find you a new coach. And I'm like, you know, I don't want any other coach anymore. And, you know, I just, I just, I just want to take from you to be my sister, you know, she's very calm and loving and, and she basically, um, at, growing up, she was always there on the sidelines coaching me anyway. So I thought this would be the best fit. So, but I had, bottom line is I don't, I don't teach, you know, really strict and stuff and I'm fun and everyone just loves it. Okay. So how did it come about that you're now coaching Christy Yamaguchi's daughter, Emma? How did this... Yeah, that was that was funny. We Christy and I last year when we got inducted to the San Jose uh, Sports Hall of Fame uh, here in San Jose, we were together, and um, I remember Carol Yamaguchi coming up to me and says, "Oh, we want to we want to call you because um, we want Emma to uh, take lessons from you. We heard you're a very good technical coach in the area," and I'm like, "Oh, thanks." And so. Um, I guess uh, Emma tried out with Christy's coach, and she was too strict. And they said, I guess Emma um, had her first lesson, one lesson with um, Christy Ness. And I guess she was, like, really strict on her in their first lesson. And I guess she turned away crying and, and ran to her mom. So um, then I did – then I called Christy's, Christy up, and I said, okay, this Thursday. Um, and she's like, oh, okay. So we met for a lesson. And um, – Christy and Carol, her mom, and Brett Hedekin um, were in the stand in her trial run. It was like, I guess it was a test run, you know. Were you nervous? I was. I was like, they were just in the stands just watching. And I was like, okay, you know. And she just started skating. So it was like, yeah. okay, you know, the the, um, the swizzles, the uh, the one foot glides and stuff. And you know, I was like, and I was shaking. I was like, what? <gasps> this is crazy, you know. I have kids doing double axles. And then I'm like, oh, wait, this is weird. You know, why am I so nervous? And... I was nervous teaching her, but I didn't realize because they didn't tell me this was like a trial basis to see if Emma liked me. And, um, and so afterwards the lesson, they go, oh, that was a great lesson. And they said, Emma, do you like, do you like Rudy? And she was like, mm-hmm, you know. That must so have like, felt so good. Yeah, it was. And then they, and I'm like, oh, I guess it was a trial. And then they go, well, I guess you're her coach now. So I'm like, oh, okay, great. It's like <laughs> winning Emma a competition. Anything, is Emma anything like Christy as a skater? Or? 
Well, I I don't remember Christy. Like I seen little videos, clips of her at that age, and I, you know she's just doing lunges and stuff. But I don't, you know, I really don't question. I mean, uh, Emma's right now. She's been skating just like a year now, and she's up to a, n- a nice toe loop. So, oh, good for her. You know, everyone's different. Yeah. You know what I mean. You have phenoms at at three years old around here, and you know, and then you have ones that have to work harder. Wow. You know, so you never so know what you're gonna. Is- what is Christy like as a skating mom? Is she anything like Carol, or is Carol still running the show? <laughs> um, Carol actually brings her on Monday to Fremont, Emma, once in a while. And then, and then sometimes Christy will bring her, and Christy will skate, because I think she's doing some Steve Disson shows, mm-hmm. so she's trying to keep in shape. So she'll skate around during her le- uh, Emma's lesson. And, but Christy is an amazing skating parent, um, she just laid back. She's like, okay, whatever. But, you know, um, uh, her, uh, for Emma's first competition in the summer, I guess, Pete, when I was warming Emma out, out um, outside, the whole family was there, and all the coaches were coming out and going, oh, my God, Chrissy's going to pass out in there. She is so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> this is level basic skills, too, you know, one foot glides. And she goes, oh, my God. And, and Christy's like, I am so nervous. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass out, you know. <laughs> she goes, this is worse than a world championships. It's so funny. <laughs> Already, when we talk about Christy and worlds and everything, for a long time you were best known as a pair skater. You and Christy winning two national titles, and in many ways, you guys were really an unlikely pairing. You jumped in opposite directions, so you were mirror pairs. Uh, you were both really meritorious single skaters, which we hardly, uh-huh. if ever, see. And you were really tiny on the ice, so you had a unique <laughs> aesthetic. So, how did you guys pair up? Well, I was. Let's see. After novice men. Um, I was 12 years old, and then I turned 13, <clears throat> and I was in. I went to junior man, because once you win nationals, you know you have to go up. Right. And I was so tiny and skinny; I was like a bag of bones. <laughs> and um, my sister skated pairs, and I used to watch her, and I'm like, "Ooh, this looks like fun." So I was like, I just tease. I'm like, "Oh, I want to skate pairs," and everyone's just laughing. They're like, "There's no way in hell that you could, you know, lift anyone because you're just like, you're." I was like four foot seven or four foot eight I don't know and then like this skinny and they were just kind of laughed it off you know I'm like no seriously I want to skate it looks like fun because I was watching my sister and then they said well um if we could find a girl for you and stuff and I remember going to public sessions and and warming up and there was this little Asian girl skating around and she was so tiny and she was doing like um flat-footed, cheated double flips and double lutzes. And I'm like, Chrissy oh, that's had cool. cheated jumps. I love it. Because <laughs> she, she had I would say, I always tease them. And it's like, oh, the pairs, the pair throws got her all her jumps clean. You know? <laughs> Except her triple sal. Oh, no. She didn't like her. Oh, but I got blamed for the, the, the her triple sal because. We were going to um, ask you that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think Christy Ness uh, blames me for because we had such a nice throw triple sal cow. She blamed the timing <laughs> issue on her triple sal. I'm like, yeah. I go, no, she learned the triple sal in novice, and we did throw triple sal in junior. So don't <laughs> don't blame me. I know yeah. you were watching those videos. You had such a beautiful throw triple sal, and she's yeah. always known. <laughs> she could she. So and it's funny because I'm teaching Emma the sal cow, and she goes, "Ooh, she's like, I think that's better than my sal cow." <laughs> You guys, you and Christy, you went to the World Junior Championships and you won the men's title and you guys got a bronze in the pair event. And the following year, you guys go back, you win the Uh pair title and then Christy wins the ladies title. And I can only imagine how just busy your days must have been back then, juggling a pair career and a single career. So what was an average day like for you in 1987 or 1988? You know, and I tell these kids too, the ones I teach and, and the parents complaining about, you know, uh, money and you know and skating and lessons and I'm just like okay and that, you know how you could, your dad tells you oh I used to walk to school ten right. miles in the snow, you know <laughs> I'm like snow. okay listen to this I'm like I skated six to eight hours a day because you know we had the we started out five in the morning figures hour mm-hmm. figures then we had an hour freestyle and then the ice cut and another hour of figures and another hour of freestyle and then we had an, uh, another hour of pairs. And then Chris and I would go back in the afternoon for another hour and a half a pair. So basically, and then basically that's like six and a half, seven, eight, sometimes eight hours a day on the ice. And then, you know, the figure boots and this and that. And so um, my kids, like some of them are like just getting like two hours in and then like all tired. And I'm just like, oh, oh, let me tell you about the days when we did eight hours, you know? Right. I can't even imagine. 
Yeah, it was it was hard. It was, uh, and then we like sometimes we go home, t- take a nap, and then go back for another hour and a half of hairs in the afternoon. So it was a long day, but that's you know that's all, all I did. And, you know that's all I craved and mm-hmm. wanted was skating was my whole world. So that's that's what I lived. Now you and Christy were always such fan favorites. So when did you really know that you and Christy had something special together? I think um, when we did our. Uh, when we first got together, we went into novice pairs and we did a competition in Los Angeles. It was just like one of those big LA, you know, Jennifer, those big LA competitions. Uh huh. Those are nerve-wracking. Yeah, and um, we were just so, and I didn't realize how good we were until like because um, we were so tiny and skinny, and I still I got up a press lift. And I remember, and we had like throw double sow, and then I think we, oh, we had side by side double S's, and then like in the early 80s, that's like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess the crowd went crazy after we um, finished, and we won the novice pair event against the LA pairs. And um, that's when I kind of knew things were working out, and I could tell like um, uh, Christy's mom knew it too. She's like, wow, you know, you're getting so many compliments, and you won against these LA seasoned LA novice teams, you know? So I think, you know, we added more lessons and we were getting more into the pairs. And I think that's when I figured out in um, when we first started in Novice that we had something special. So you actually lived with the Yamaguchis and, would, you know, wake up and be eating at the breakfast table, eating mm-hmm. your Cheerios with everyone. So oh, no, that like no it's, not, it's not eating at the table. <laughs> <laughs> it was like four o'clock wake up call. And then um, we had to leave because we had to be on the ice at five o'clock for figures in San Mateo. So we left about 4.25. So it was one of those things where I woke up, took a shower, and I walked to the kitchen, and Christy had two bowls of cereal and it was um, and like two drops of milk because um, she didn't want the milk to spill in the car. So it was like two drops. I'm like, girl, I need more milk than that. You know, it's, no. it's like two drops, two drops. And then <laughs> so we're eating on the way while uh, Christy's mom was driving us to um, the rink, and we're eating our cereal. But I did live with them for um, probably about four or five years. Um, I had like my own room. You know, it was like two months solid there and then maybe like a week back with my mom. And, you know, because my mom had, um, she couldn't drive a lot of times because she was sick, mental health issues. And my dad was gone as a truck driver for like a week hauling rocket fuel. So, and my sister was in the shows and working. So it was just easier for me to uh, live at their house. So we go uh, rink to rink. Is that like a little too much togetherness when you're spending literally every single minute together of the day or does it get intense? Or? No, no, I mean, um, not really. We never really fought. I, I just remember um, like I was, I was trained um, by the pair coach saying no matter what, like if um, I threw Christy or whatever, that it's always the man's fault you know, on the throws or whatever and stuff. So I really couldn't get mad at her. You know, we never, we hardly missed, but you know, and I knew, like, we never fought much at all. Like, we were always quiet. We never said anything to each other, really, you know, when we were skating and training. But it was more like a, a good relationship, brother and sister. You know, we were always in the back doing our homework in the back seat, you know. And, and that was about it. You know, we never, we never fought. Just go out and do your job. Yeah, and I, knew, and I knew it was like I had to do my job in the pairs because she was so dang consistent that, you know, I, it was like a competition. Like, I knew we were going side-by-side side triples and this and that. Like, I, I knew I just had to land it because I knew she was going to land it. And I remember if, if we even stepped out or missed a triple or throw triples out, I remember um, Christy's mom always say, okay, you got to do right after the long, whatever you missed, you got to do three times in a row. So if a lift came down, we had to do it lift and then come back and do another lift, another lift or triple twist, triple twist. And I was like, so I really didn't want to do that. So I made sure I landed everything. (laughs) Well, it's funny too, Rudy, because I think I read an article when we were researching this where Christy said that you were the most consistent skater she had ever seen that you guys would go in to do side by side jumps. And she said she didn't even have to look at you because she knew you were going to land it. I knew she was going to land it. So I was like, oh, I better land it because I don't want to be doing this over and over like three times. (laughs) Right. Three times afterwards. Yeah. (laughs) I love that. So in the 89 and the 90 season, you decided to forego your singles career to focus on the pair. But Christy stayed in it and she continued to juggle both disciplines. So why did you decide to step away from your single career? And did you find it odd or hard that she was still doing both? Uh, both disciplines? 
Um, I just lost, you know, I just said for some reason I did a senior one senior level and I did really well. And then I, I just loved pair so much. It was so exciting for me. And I just, and I thought we were, you know, going to be national champions. So I just gave it up because I was losing interest in the singles. Mm -hmm. And I knew that we were going to be like a first the f next year, like uh, first or second at, at the senior level. And I'm like, you know, I just want to focus on the pairs. And I knew she was so good in singles. That I, you know, I didn't even give her that ultimatum. You know, I, I knew she would just continue. But I'm like, you know, what? I'm just going to put more time. So, um, like, I would just run instead of my singles programs, I would run while she was training singles, I would play the music and do the full run throughs with the triples and pretend lifts, you know, through mm -hmm. run throughs. So, but I just knew that I was losing a little interest in my singles career because I just loved pair so much. And um, I think her decision, you know, it's just she, she liked to do both, but it, you know, just caught up to her. It was so hard to do you know, at those competitions at Worlds and yeah. stuff, you know, figures. I, I mean, we had figures, and then she had to go to right, race off to a short program practice and singles, and then short program practice in pairs, long program practice, short program practice, and it was just like nonstop the whole week. And I think it was just wearing on her. Well, yeah, you talk about that in, in at the 1990 World Championships. <laughs> yeah, it was hard for yeah, her. Yeah, she stumbled in outside of just being her partner and you know not yeah. wanting to see her do poorly did that yeah. worry you at all that maybe she couldn't juggle both did you feel like it may portend that she would have to make a choice and perhaps uh, I knew yeah I knew that like in the back of my mind it was just it was sad and I was trying so hard and I knew when we were touring with um Champions and I Tom Collins that one year and it was 89 mm -hmm. and you know and I know we we're just kind of pulling apart and I was trying everything to hold on to what we had because I you know you hear it through the grapevine and you hear gossip and stuff and and Christy was, you know, hanging out with a different crowd, and and I just knew that even even when we were training in Canada, like uh, certain skaters were pulling her away from me, mm. you know, yeah. you know, like I we I lived in an apartment by myself, and she lived with her coach, and I I just knew they were grabbing her, you know, and just pulling her away from me, and I just, I knew in the back of my head that this might be the last year, you know. And so uh, when it came time to it, it was just, it was just so devastating, you know, even though I knew it was coming, it was just, it was just heartbreaking. Oh, I can imagine. So how did you finally find out what was that conversation like? And what was, I just can't even imagine what that initial reaction would be because you kind of know it's coming, but you don't want to, it's almost like a, yes. like, you know, a romantic breakup. It's, it's like a marriage. Yeah. I mean, you know, and um, I remember getting a, after the tour in 90 tour, mm -hmm. um, um, we got a phone call and said, um, we were going to meet in Dublin, Pleasanton, this is where we trained in pairs. And there was uh, a judge and she, I guess she, there was a mediator, you know? And so I just remember my dad sitting there and just, and my dad was is blind. He was getting blind. And, you know, he was, I said, oh, we're going to have a meeting with Christy. And I, we didn't tell him and we just kind of knew. So my sister and I drove to Dublin and we sat down in this room and they just explained that it's just getting too hard for Christy. And so we're just going to, um, we're going to stop the pairs, you know? And, and it was just, I was just, I couldn't say anything. I was just so, you know how when your, your heart just drops to the ground yes. and it's just like, you don't know what to say. And you're like, okay. You know? And then Laura and I just uh, walked to the car and I just remember just crying all the way home oh. to my dad. And it was, and then that was the hardest thing was, um, because my dad was kind of holding on because he just loved the pairs. He just, you know, he just loved watching us skate together. And I just remember going home and saying, we're done, you know, and stuff. And I just, I just remember my dad um, just put his head down like this in a tear. That's the first time I ever saw a tear come down his face, uh -huh. you know, and I was like, and it just got me angry, you know. I was like, yeah, because oh. you don't want to see your parents suffer, but it's something that's right. completely yeah. out of your control. And then it seemed like he just went downhill from there. You know what I mean? Like he, yeah. he, my dad was holding on to life because he wanted to see us at the Olympics and, yeah. you know, but that was really hard. And, and it was like a marriage. And I knew, um, they said, why didn't you go into pairs again, find another partner? And I'm like, you know, I can't. it was such a great marriage. And it was like, I couldn't find anyone as good as Christy, you know, that small, that compact and so consistent and so good. It's like you guys were made for each other. Yes. And so I'm just like, you know, I'm, I don't want to go on the shows now. Um, I have a junior world title. Maybe I'll just come back and try senior men's and, you know, just kind of play around with that. So that's what our decision was. We, uh, we had a mediator. Mm -hmm. 
So now you two really, you know, grew up together, and you write in your book that you actually came out to Carol Yamaguchi, and in your book you said, "quote She, um, she was in total denial. I imagine that mm -hmm. some of what was going through Carol's mind had to do with skating. Given the all-American image of the U.S. Figure Skating Association, my being gay could only be a major liability in a pair's career that seemed to have limitless possibilities." And then you said. For the rest of the time Christy and I skated together, I always felt like things were on edge and that if I did anything wrong, Carol would send me packing. Our relationship, which for me had always been based on love, was now based on fear. Now, that mm -hmm. whole quote is really about Carol. Yes. So what role did Carol play in your skating career? She was, oops, oh, um, she was, she was almost everything, you know, she... Um, she was where we trained in San Mateo was um, it was like a, uh, in, a, a, in a mall. So all the parents would sit like right on the rail by on the, the chairs, you know, it was like a food court. Mm -hmm. So she was right there and she was always like our pair coach wasn't there. She was training singles there. So every time we were skating pairs there, she was basically our coach there. And she was our, like our coach and teaching us things, you know, um, different death spirals and stuff. So she was like our, our little coach. We, we would go to her by the rail because we had no pair coach there. And she was like a coach. She was like a, a mother because she took care of me. I lived with her, you know, and mm -hmm. she, and she, she taught me a lot of stuff and, you know, a friend, a mother and a coach all, she was everything mm -hmm. to me. And so yeah. that's why, you know, when I, yeah, I had explained to her, you know, it was, you know, that I was gay. It was just, you know, this is who I am. And it was like, I was just so scared and nervous and, you know, and, and I just wanted her to, you know, to accept me uh, for who I was. Understandable. And who I am. Okay. Um, and do you, th was she kind of the final decider in ending your pair's career? I mean, what role did she really play in that? You know, was I she think making it's a collaboration? It was, um, because Christy was so tired. She, you know, Christy agreed at Christy Ness, you know, um, was saying that it's it's affecting her singles career. It's making her tired because the senior ladies were always like towards the end. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it was a collaboration between, I think, Christy, uh, Carol, and Christy Ness that were, you know, coming down to it. Like she needs to focus on um, one. And I think it was going to be the singles, of course. I mean, it had to be really hard for you after, you know, seeing her immediately, you know, become world champion after you break up. And you wrote, and you told Christine Brennan in her book, um, Inside Edge, I can't lie, she walks into this rink and everyone wants an autograph and I'm just sitting there. I don't want to break down and cry, but when Christy comes in, I get upset. I get upset with the success that she's had while I'm struggling. I could have paid my parents back for all the money they spent in skating if Christy and I had made it. Mm -hmm. So what was it like to watch her succeed after you two <clears throat> broke up? Because it wasn't like it happened... Gradually, she went on and she won Skate America like I immediately <laughs> after you. <laughs> so I remember that Skate America too. <laughs> it was just like simple things. I mean, I was it was like jealousy. Mm -hmm. um, I was hurt. Um, you know, it's it's like hard. It's like you know how you, you break up with an, like uh, somebody in like a marriage divorce. It's like you know, it's like you don't want anything good to happen to them. Right. You, know? <laughs> you want them to get fat and ugly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't get anybody, you right. know, and then she was like succeeding. I'm just like, oh my God, you know. It almost makes I'm, you feel worse about yourself. Yeah, and I just remember it was so funny because I, I remember going in, in pairs and stuff, and I always wanted Christy to be, um, it's like simple things like this, like um, putting her hair up in a ballet bun for pairs because her ponytail kept hitting me on the triple twist on the way down, like, you know, my eyes and stuff, yeah. you know. And you know how Chris always had the ponytail? Uh-huh, the poof ponytail. And I go, can we try some, like, for, like, two years, can we try a nice ballet bun, you know? And um, they always said, no, 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 she's known for the ponytail. And I remember that Skate America, she wore a ballet bun. Oh. <laughs> the first time I've ever heard, I'm like. Isn't it always it like, those little things that get The you? little things. I'm, like, sitting there in front of the TV, I'm like, she has a ballet bun. <laughs> It was like, it was, I felt like I was like, oh my God, is that a little dig at me, you right. know? <laughs> but of course, you know, just like, it's like a marriage when you get a divorce and stuff, there's, you know, there's animosity and stuff, you know, but, you know, times have, you know, have passed and, you know, I was hurt then and, you know, but I think things work out for a reason and I just, I think things are great now. It's like almost full circle now. Mm -hmm. So when she won the Olympics, 
You actually yeah. allowed a film crew to film you watch the event. Why on earth would you let this happen? You know, given all the conflicting <laughs> emotions. Like, why yeah. was this a good idea? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it was. I remember them, the um, TV station calling me and saying, can we film you? And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm not on TV anymore. Might as well get some kind of 15 right. minute game. <laughs> I'm like, yay. <laughs> was it hard to suppress your emotion? I mean, because I'm sure there was so many conflicting emotions. You're happy because part of you loves her. But then I'm sure yeah. there was jealousy too. How was it to kind of suppress any emotion on your face? I was, you know what, I think um, when she won and I was on TV, I think I was genuinely happy for her. Like, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. she's Olympic champion. Yeah. I think the time, <clears throat> I think the one where I got really uh, jealous and really sad and upset was when uh, at the Olympic trials, the nationals were in Florida. And um, this is like a year and a half before we, um, uh, after we split up. And she won that nationals in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to the, there was like the nationals party, but it was at the, um, oh, what's that place called? It's not like Walt Disney World, but it's um, Universal. I think Universal, okay. yeah. And I remember it was the, the crowd there. And then on stage, they said they announced all the, um, the Olympic team, the skaters. And I'm just sitting there in the audience. And then all the Olympic figure skating team went up on the stage and waved to the crowd. And I was just like, Oh my God! I'm standing here in the crowd and not, you know, going up those stairs to meet him, and I think that was the most hurtful time. Well, yeah, because that was the Olympic team that you had imagined yeah. you guys were going to be on. So, it, I mean, we talk about so much the ups and downs that you and Chris have mm -hmm. gone through, but really, your relationship, I think, is something that so many people can relate to. Any long-term relationship you have, years of kind of turmoil, but it's really a success right. because you seem to mend it. Any past heartbreak. So how did you guys get to the point where you are today where you're coaching her daughter? And you know what? Um, we've come to terms with everything a long time ago. I remember just, um, I remember just um, competing and um, when I won the uh, nationals in San Jose, I remember she was getting, I think she was getting inducted there. And she was in the audience and I did the short program in San Jose and I was third after the short and then um, I went home and then she got inducted to the Hall of Fame and we didn't, really didn't talk much before the San Jose Nationals. And she said that she went and she flew out back to Stars and Ice and then she then I they she landed in Stars and Ice and I guess Kurt Brown and everyone goes, oh my God, do you know Rudy just won the national championship? And she's like, what? <gasps> you know, she was like so excited they said. And then um, she called me like right away congratulating me you know, um, about for the win. And it, it was just so nice. And that was just like a little bit of an icebreaker, you know, and mm -hmm. we just started talking and stuff. And then I turned pro and we did a lot of world pro professional competitions together. And we were actually on ice wars to get on the same team. And we did a lot of competitions. So it was like, you know, things, you know, came for full circle and just kind of, it was just like, a mending spot, you know, like we went our different roads and, you know, and, and then we just kind of came back together. And so, um, and, and when I, um, found out that I was, um, uh, HIV positive and I did the people magazine article and stuff and everyone found out, mm -hmm. um, she was on stars and ice and we were on champions and ice. And I remember, um, um, Tommy uh, Collins was like, um, Christy's on the phone. She wants to talk to you. And it was just so nice and an emotional um, call. And it just, that just really bonded us again, you know, close. Well, that's great. And, and after you and Christy broke up, you, you talk about your singles career doing so mm -hmm. well in San Jose. You really did focus on that career. But initially, you had some tough years, both on and off the ice. You lost your father in 1993, the following right. year, your brother, and then a coach. And I can only imagine just emotionally how difficult that must have been to to deal with that and then to have to skate and understandably you stumbled on the ice got uh, uh -huh. eighth at <laughs> nationals in 95 right. so you kind of seemed like you were done after that you took eight months off yeah. you were coaching <laughs> and then you decided to come back in 96 and outside of the obvious that it was in san jose was right. there something bigger that compelled you to come back because some may argue you know are you a masochist putting yourself through this again after so many tough years both on and off the ice so what was your mindset heading into the 96 season uh, my mindset was there was like really no set you know what i mean it uh -huh. was just like 
I was, I remember um, coaching and coaching classes and um, riding my bike because my car broke down. And um, I just remember riding back and forth and teaching San Jose State and, and classes and coaching uh, some of my sister's kid. And um, I just remember getting off the bike and looking at them. They had, they put up the poster and it said, um, it said San Jose Nationals. You know, and I still, it still was up in the air of like, what am, am I going to turn pro? Am I going to be doing like, you know, Knott's Berry Farm or. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I was like, ooh, San Jose National. Are you kidding me? And I was like, when does it come to your hometown? You know, and, and especially San Jose. It's like, wow, that's like unheard of. And so I'm like, oh my God. So I had it in my head. I'm like, God, maybe, because I really didn't turn pro then. And I was like, and st- everything was still up in the air. And I'm like, oh, and I, I talked to my sister. And I'm like, should I try to go for that national since it's in our in the in our backyard basically? And um, she's like, you know, if if you really want to do it, Rudy, I'm 100 percent behind you, and you know, let's do it. And I just thought it'd be a good chance to be my like the last nationals where my family could actually just drive down the road to the arena and watch me because they never could come to my nationals besides my sister. And I thought, oh, that'd be fun for all my um, friends and and my family to actually come and watch me. And I just remember going, you know what? I bet I could do this nationals, and you know, I'll, I could be because I'm the hometown guy. I could do like a pop a double axle, and they still would cheer. And I just remember because <laughs> they you know love what? you so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm like you know hometown. You know when they announce your name, yeah. you know from San Jose, California. You know, and I'm like, ooh, watch! I could probably do a double axle or whatever, and some they'd be like, all raw, the big roar. And I'm like, ooh, this would be fun, you know. So I just remembered, you know. Um, uh, just decided, I said, okay, I'm going to go for it and I'm just going to do it because it's in my backyard and it, why pass up a chance, you know, nationals being there. And, um, so, but I, you know, I kind of wanted to look good in front of my <laughs> friends and family, you know, so I just remember, um, training really hard and just being focused and, and not having any pressure on me. You know, that, that was the one thing that I was really good for me. It's like, you know, no big deal. You know, I was eight the year before and there's no... I wasn't in the media guide. I there was nothing. I just said, but the bottom line is, I wanted to look really good. So I was doing like twenty miles on um, cycling a day, going to the gym, um, running complete full run throughs um, of long programs. Because before I would like do almost full run throughs, but you know, you know, hey, Jennifer, you would skip a spin or uh, something. <laughs> you always know? that lay back you know? spin at the end of my you know? program. Yeah, or, or pretend like somebody got in your way and triple, you're like, oh, you know? Yes, where there's like no one on the ice at all. There's no one on the ice, you're like, oh, darn it. And they're like, um, nobody was there, you know? I saw someone, I swear. I know. And so I was like, I would do full run, I, I, even to where I was like screaming at the end because I would do f- full, like every single mm-hmm. step for like leading up to the San Jose Nationals and just training because I wanted to look good. So I think it, you know, worked out for me. It definitely worked out for you. So you didn't start training until August, but now your sister is the one at the boards with you and she mm-hmm. kind of has to, you know, push you into gear. Now, what was that like? Because my sister and I can't even go to lunch with each other without <laughs> getting in a fight. So, <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I, my sister and I, I think we were just close because she, she basically raised me from a, a little boy because, my, you know, my mom was in and out of the hospitals with her mental is- issues. And my dad was gone. So my sister, she didn't even have a, a license, and she was driving me back and forth to the arena. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think she was like a mother, a friend, and, and just always there watching my skating and very supportive. So, <clears throat> you know, you don't bite the hand that feeds you, you know? <laughs> so I think, you know, I think we just, we just got along. And we got along, too, because when she was competing as a, 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 younger, uh, a young girl, I was always supported. I was in the stands cheering her on. So I think, you know, the, um, both of us competing and cheering each other on it just brought us close together. Yeah, you understand each other. You understand, yeah, what we're going through. And, you know, it's just the love there. And when you got to the event, the commentators talk about how you were winning every practice in San Jose. And it seemed like you were the one to beat. So for so many years when you struggled with inconsistency, and one of the things I noted, Rudy, when we were on tour right. is that, you're the most consistent skater. You are the hardest worker. You would go out there every uh, night and skate so well. I always admired you for that. So you talk about having no pressure. Did you think at all that you were the one to beat, as the commentators spoke about? Did you go in when you got to the event thinking, hey, I could win this? Um, 
I didn't think I could win it. I was just hoping for that third spot. I just remember, and I didn't know that I was winning every practice. I, as I, I talked about before, you know, I wanted clean programs, mm-hmm. like in, in August, like right when I got my long program, full run throughs, and just making sure everything was clean. Mm-hmm. And you know, and I, th- I think riding that bike twenty miles a day, you know, for my cardio, it was so easy. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. So I remember just doing clean programs the whole week in San Jose and, and not realizing, cause I didn't watch anybody else, you know, anybody like Todd Eldridge mm-hmm. or anybody in, cause they were in different groups. And uh, so I didn't know like Brian, like they, like Dick Button and Brian Bartana were watching and saying, or whatever that I was winning the practices cause I didn't watch them. You know, I just left right after my practice. So I just kind of just didn't even, you know, think of that. But then the pressure, the consistency continued um, for the world championships but um, I, I felt more pressure there, especially in the initial round, because we had to do an initial round at Worlds. Mm-hmm. And that was the hard part. And, but I was still consistent. But um, now they were just thinking I was like a one-hit wonder. And so <laughs> and I, I actually – I, I know. I was like, oh, gosh. You know, like people were saying that to me. And I'm like – and before Worlds. And even though I was st- skating clean in practice before Worlds, and the, this one-hit wonder thing was like – it was bugging me. So I'm like – Okay, so my sister set up a sports psychologist, you know, like once a week, like a month before Worlds, like every day, you know, mm-hmm. keeping my sessions and stuff, and that really helped. Just to get you in that zone. Yeah, to get in my zone, you know, so that that was great. So I did have to go to sports psychologist before Worlds because <laughs> that really got to me when they were saying <laughs> I was oh. only good at national. <laughs> Now, going back to nationals, in the mm-hmm. short program, you actually were the only one to do a triple axle, triple toe. Um, you skated the clean program that I right. think your other competitors who finished ahead of you, both Todd Eldridge and Scott right. Davis, they did not have as good of a program. Yet your marks were 5'4 to 5'7, and mm-hmm. there were a couple of 5'4s. So mm-hmm. skating so well, did the marks matter to you? Were you nervous about that third spot based on your marks? I mean, what was your reaction? No, I wasn't, I wasn't mad at all. If you can see on the video, I wasn't mad. I was excited that I was in third and excited to get like a couple five eights, you know, because it's been a while. I think the last time I got like five eights in, um, was a junior world when I won, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Ooh, five, eight. Ooh. And then, and then it showed that. And then the crowd was like booing and stuff. And I, I kind of looked at the crowd. I'm like, Oh, these are good. You know, I'm excited. But um, th- th- and then I got third after that, and then I just remember um, Laura was Laura, my sister was stressed out, and she told me after you know because she was just praying because you only know, took top three that year to Worlds, mm-hmm. and she was like, oh my god, this is gonna be so devastating if he drops to fourth and doesn't make the world team, you know, and and even in the long program, um, I wasn't thinking that I was gonna win. I w- I remember going into my last spin and saying oh my goodness, I think I'm going to make the world team. That's all it was. I think I'm going to make the world team. And that's why when you see the, the 6.0s and, and, and then I looked down and I, you saw I, the computer showed that I won, it was just like, I was, it was like crazy. <laughs> you, had, you didn't know. You, you were the last skater. You didn't know how Todd had skated or anybody else. You just went in blind. <clears throat> um, no, it's so funny because, you know, I, I was last in that last group, and yeah. it was this, uh, the crazy. I remember going, putting my Walkman on after the six-minute warm-up, taking off my skates, and I actually fell asleep in a <gasps> chair. You did not. <laughs> yeah, it was, an hour, it was literally an hour after the warm-up before I skated. How are you so relaxed? Because usually like, skaters <clears throat> are just... I, don't know, I was listening to this music, and I was like, I kind of went to sleep. And I, I, I knew in my heart, because um, there was a monitor back there, and my sister was watching, um, standing there watching, and then she was looking back at me, but she was giving me that look, because she was watching, like, Dan Honder did clean or something. Uh-huh. And then, and I knew he was skating, because I could... I heard my music, but I just knew the skating order. And she looked at me and she gave me this smile, but she gave me this smile of like, oh crap. Right? You all, don't, <laughs> they're can doing you good. always tell that smile yeah. where you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. From yeah. your coaches, uh, you're just like, yeah. oh my God, they're like smiling like, oh, you poor thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity smile. And you're like, it would be better just not to do anything. Yeah, so I was just like going, oh well, you know, just just do what you have to do, you know? Yeah. And then, then I knew that like, uh, um, and then I think Scott Davis 
and I, I knew he was on and I knew my, of course my sister gives me that smile, but she gave me a smile of that, you know, he did a couple mistakes. You can just see it in the eyes, right? you know, like, <laughs> yes, exactly. and then, and then I was like, okay, well, you know what, just, just go out there and just do what you did in practice. No big deal. You know? So that was it. <laughs> now, when you won your national title, your long program actually beat the NCAA basketball tournament that night. And skating was an extremely big deal back in 1996. I think for the skaters today, it's almost difficult to imagine how big skating was. When did you realize that you were famous? And what was it like becoming famous overnight? Um, it, 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 the strange, that was a strange part because I remember um, leaving the arena after I won and leaving San Jose and I'm, we're just, and of course my sister and her, um, fiance were parked in the parking lot, but we were walking with everybody, you know, just the road and the people were just screaming out their door, their windows and doors. And, you know, even the Harley Davidson guys were going, yeah, Rudy, you know, I'm like, Oh my goodness. I'm like, you know, like it was so hard. And it was like, we had to have security guards car because everyone was you know coming up to us in the car and wouldn't let us out and autographs and I'm like ooh I'm like I got my little 15 minutes of thing here outside and then I woke up and, and in the morning at my house and I just remember and my mom's like um go look out your window and there was like um there was like 10 uh, camera cameramen and and paparazzi like a whole bunch of paparazzi outside my window like what am I going to do the day you know oh my God. I'm How like, this is strange. You adjust to that, though. Can I, I can imagine you. It would either kind of motivate you or freak you out. Um, it, it was nice. It was. It, start, it started getting tough doing a lot of the interviews, like oh, back to back, and and Laura getting hundreds of calls from this and this and this, and trying to. And we didn't have an agent then, mm -hmm. and it was just getting really tough. And it was. You could tell it was like wearing out my nerves because I wanted to practice and train, and. and to the rink and I was trying to do my normal training and practice sessions and they're like oh well can you put a mic on and go through the long program you, you, know, you know those mics Jennifer right. like, I, I can't rotate on the side you know and, and they're trying to do this and interrupt and like, okay well, can you teach him like over here and get this shot and it was like it was interrupting me you know and it was and it was kind of irritating sometimes because it was getting overwhelming and I remember before worlds like I stepped on the ice and they're okay, go and do this, this. And I, the first time I really didn't warm up and I remember doing a triple let's and it was, this was three weeks before worlds and I twisted my ankle and I sprained my ankle on the, the tap of the triple let's. And I was like, Oh no. And then I had to do a Russian competition right before worlds. And I did this short program and I was such in pain. I just withdrew from the long and, and just got therapy. And I, I just started jumping one week before worlds. No, you actually, Join Champions on Ice briefly for a couple weeks between right. Nationals and Worlds. Were you doing your programs on tour then? How were you still preparing? I was. Oh, I remember uh, Tom Collins, like, uh, it was called Winter Tour. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, did you do Winter Tour? I when didn't, but you know what? I think one year you came to Boston, and this is funny, but my little sister had such a huge crush on you, and we saw you at the Four <laughs> Seasons, and she, I think you were drinking tea, and she uh -huh. literally freaked out. She was so excited. Oh my God, that's yeah. so cute. But no, it wasn't around when I was skating. Oh my God. Um, it was called Winter Tour. And it was, just, it was a brief. And, and Tom Collins was like, and we're, my sister's like, well, it's before Worlds. It's too close. And um, I saw my sprained ankle. Mm -hmm. And he's all, just come in and, and do your like short program, you know, to Pachelbel's Canon. And, I, and it, was, it was good that I did that because it really, um, doing my short program um, on Champions and Ice right before Worlds just, um, really helped with my style and performance, you know, when I, when I hit world. So that was, that was really fun and it was a good experience. Well, after I, I worlds, when you joined champions on, on the tour full time huh? by yourself, you're not on as a pair, you're on as Rudy. Yes. So what was that whole experience like? It was so fun. I don't know. I just, I just love touring. Is it, right, Jennifer? Didn't you love touring? I did. It's, you're just taking care of it. Tom Collins is just an awesome guy. I, I know, I know. And he, um, it was just so fun. It was, it's almost like 
you know, when you get invited to these tours, don't you feel like you've made it, Jennifer? Yes. Like, like, oh my God, you know how many je- jealous skaters there are that you made it to his tour? You get asked, you know, and you know, you get the four, five star hotels and the and things. It's the that, bag, the bag with your number on it. <laughs> just remember that. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just, you just feel like a star. You feel like, you know, like, you just feel like a star, like, oh my God, you've made it. You're on Tom Collins' Champions and Ice Tour. It was just exciting. You know, it, it was. I, I remember that too. Yeah. So a year before you joined his tour as a single skater and your world just erupted, you came out to Christine Brennan for her book Inside Edge. So why did you choose to come out to Christine? Um, I just, I just wanted to be honest, and I remember her calling me up, and she wanted to you. And then you know, and and during that time, I was just, you know, just being honest of who I was, and mm-hmm. you know, and and whatever. And you know, as we could say before, maybe it was like okay, 15 minutes of fame, here we go again. You know what I mean? Right. And then it just, it, it came out like right before nationals, didn't it? When I won? Yeah, it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and I just remember going from there and the, I remember after I won and going to the, um, to do the uh, press conference and that was just like, oh yeah, that's what I, you know, I revealed a lot of stuff in Christine Brennan's book. And then that was the first thing that I goes, how's it feel to be the first, um, openly gay, you know, and I was like, Oh, oh yeah. Okay, great. I guess. <laughs> right, it's, like, it's something I'm sure you don't even think about ever. It's just yeah, I, I just wanted to just my you know my sexuality. Oh, Mexican American living in a trailer, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Cliff Notes version of like anything uh, stereotypical. I just remember looking at that like, uh, yeah, oh, how's it feel to be the first openly gay Mexican American living in a trailer? And I, I just remember in the press conference looking at Lauren, I'm like. Uh, am I supposed to answer that? Or should you know? Yeah, uh, shouldn't we be celebrating something else? And I guess it was a big thing, you know. I'm like, okay. In Christine's Brennan's book, you know, you mentioned. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm gay. I get it. I live in a trailer. <laughs> right. It's like there's so much more to you. So, what was, yeah. What was the reaction to? Because I think you and I probably know so many people in the skating world too. They're out, but they're not. They don't come out to the press. So, what was yeah. the reaction from your peers? Were they supportive? Did anybody have anything to to say about it? No, not really. I just, I, you know, because I, a lot of uh, my friends that were in skating and stuff, they, they didn't knew at a young age. Right. Because I was out to them. But like, and I just thought the whole, you know, the skating world just knew and stuff. But it was like, once I made it big and then won and I was on TV and stuff. And then that's when, it, you know, they want a story, you know. Right. Oh my God, you're gay, you know. <laughs> So like all my friends in skating, they, they all knew and stuff. So it was no, no big deal, but you know, you know, and I don't, I don't know who would not be, you know, out. a lot of, a lot of them, my friends were like straight and together, you married, you know, like Liz Punslin and Jared Swallow, you know? <laughs> so for a long time, you were really known as the gay skater. So how weird was that? Because I mean, don't obviously, trailer trash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it was such an absurd title, you know, to be the gay skater in skating that I think on Will and Grace, you know, Jack says to Jack says, yeah, he's the gay one. He's the gay one. And Karen goes, the gay one. He's like, what? (laughs) (laughs) That was, I know. I just, you know, I, I don't know. There's, it just seems like back in those days, okay, what what do we have? Jennifer, you know, like all those, they're all those straight boys and from Russia. Right. So, was your how was your relationship on tour with those guys? Because I mean, did, it was fine. It was, it was you know that was fine because you know I was um, you know Jennifer I was like the class clown you right. know I teased them in the dress room and stuff and they just got a kick out of it. they got so used to it they're just like oh whatever it is you know if I you know if I if I tucked it or you know stuff like this and <laughs> Philippe Kendall goes ooh you know <laughs> <laughs> and Philippe we all know he's got, he's gone out there. I know. <laughs> Philippe's like anything that's breathing. You know? Right? He'll hit on anything. <laughs> He'll hit <on> anything. <laughs> but it was just fun. It was like, I just loved teasing the guys and in the dressing room. We just had fun. And they were just like so used to it. They're just like, oh, it's just Rudy. Right. It yeah. seems like you owned it. And, yes. you know. So in 1996, Rudy, you officially turned pro. And at the time, a San Jose Mercury article, it kind of insinuated that you were upset that U.S. figure skating hadn't chosen to send you to Skate America for the start of the 97 season. I think instead you were sent to, like, Cup of Russia, Nations Cup. So in any way, did this influence your decision to turn professional? Did you feel slighted that you weren't chosen for Skate America? Um, 
I, you know, I got passed over Skate America a couple of times when I was, uh, I remember one year at Nationals, I was fifth and I ended up to be first alternate to Skate America. And I remember Todd Eldridge was, I think was seventh that year at Nationals mm -hmm. and he wasn't even an alternate at Skate America and someone got hurt and they didn't even call the first alternate me. They chose Todd Eldridge over me to go to Skate America. And I remember that's the first article I took out about Skate America getting passed over. So, of course, I was, you know, mad about that, you know, like, why are they not sending me to Skate America? I was always mad about that. But in, in going back, I knew in back of my head, like, before San Jose Nationals, this was going to, this was going to be my last Nationals because it was in my hometown. And that's how I planned, you know. And um, I remember sitting down, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I, I really want to turn pro because I, this, it was in my head that San Jose was my last nationals and it was like my Olympics and, you know, and it's like gambling, you know, I got all the contracts in shows and professional stuff coming up and contracts and it's like gambling. What happens if I did compete at um, the nationals and got third or fourth the following year or didn't even make the Olympic team, you know, all those contracts are going to be like torn up, mm -hmm. you know? So it's basically, it's like gambling with my money and, you know, it's like, no one to fold them and no one to walk away and no one to run, you know? And I remember sitting down with uh, Mr. Kwan and he was like the, the, the last person to say, you know, I, you're, you're such a good prof um, showman, sh showman skater, you know, I think professional will be really good for you. And that's when they had all those world pros. They had like 11 professional competitions every, every year. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? And this is, I really love performing and I didn't, I didn't want, I just didn't want to train anymore. And I knew San Jose was my last song, you know. Rudy, there's such a feeling that if you come out and skating, all the endorsement opportunities will go away. You won't be invited to shows. And you didn't seem to have that experience, at least on the show level. Did it impact your professional career negatively or positively? Did you see you know, yourself not being considered for endorsements when you turned professional because you were gay? Was it something that impacted you? No, I just, I, you know, I knew bottom line is that male skaters don't get a lot of endorsements at all. Hardly any, you know, do you know, you notice that, you know, mm -hmm. it's like you get a lot of professional competitions, contracts to like ice shows and whatever, but you know, I mean, what do you, what do you see? Do you see Brian Boitano, Olympic champion? Do you see him getting like a um, Nike, you know, endorsements and, and stuff and TV, you know, shavers commercial, you know, you don't see any of that for male skaters. It's usually the women you know, so I just knew that wasn't uh, a thing that was on my head about, um, oh my God, I'm out, so I'm going to lose endorsements that way, you know. A lot of uh, uh, male skaters that win the Olympics don't get endorsements. It's just not a, figure skating male is just not endorsement material. <laughs> so do you think it's bogus that so many men don't come out and use that as an excuse not to come out, that it's going to hurt their endorsements? Do you think they need a reality check that they're not going to get these endorsements anyway? Or? No, I don't. I don't know who's in in the closet, and you know, I just don't. You know, I, I just, I just gave up. You know, I thought maybe I could open up doors and you know stuff. You know, I don't really know anyone's um, sexual preference and skating and anymore. You know, I just, I'm so out of the loop at, at, in that thing because it doesn't, we don't tour anymore and stuff. So you know, if they want to come out, they come out. If they, um, if they do, then that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. it's up to each individual person. So yeah, what, it is. Yeah, and one of the things that I found interesting during my research, Rudy, was that in a June 1997 New York article, uh, New York Times article, you said at the time that no official from U.S. Figure Skating had telephoned or sent a congratulatory note after your 96 season, which I thought was kind of odd. And you also said at the time, when skating judges greet you backstage on tour, some of those who formerly hugged you now offer a distant handshake. So why do you think there was this change? Um, I, I don't, maybe it's some of the articles and say, um, after I won and, you know, putting the, the judges out there saying that, um, over the years, they never supported me. They were, um, they wanted the all American, you mm -hmm. know, they were, you know, I said they're like, oh, that some of them are homophobic and, you know, it was, they wanted an all American champion and, and they probably, some of them, I think, you know, got, saw the articles and, you know, I think that's when it came down to, you know, okay, okay, you know, we're kind of upset at you. So here's 
the handshake. You know what I mean? Right. It was kind of like reprimanding it's like, you. Yeah, reprimanding me like, you know, whatever. You have nothing to do with, you know, the our world anymore. You're a professional now. You know, here's whatever. Bye. You know? Right, right. <clears throat> so that's it, you know. Oh, well, no big deal. Now, you were very successful as a professional competitor, and mm-hmm. you were very consistent. Yet every year you went to the World Pro, which um, the World Pro is, I guess, people don't understand now, but it was really a very prestigious competition. And oh, yes. a lot of a lot of the very famous coaches would be the judges. And it seemed like every year something always happened with you at the World Pro where maybe you didn't get the marks <coughs> you were deserved or the crowd would boo you. Oh. Did it almost feel like you were going back they to didn't. an amateur again? <laughs> they didn't boo me. They booed the judges. <laughs> yes, I meant booing the judges. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> um, no, it's just... It, it was just crazy because I remember, I, I don't want to name names. <laughs> um, I remember at a World Pro and um, I skated really well. And there was, um, we'll say, a Bible Belt judge. <laughs> <laughs> a very and famous Bible Belt judge. In you probably know who I'm talking about, right? Yes. Okay. A beloved well, skater. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, <laughs> And I remember my marks were like, um, and I did Fosse, and I did Triple Axel, and did a clean program. <clears throat> and I think I was second after that technical. And I had like 9.9, 9.9, 9.8, 9.9, 9.9, and then a 9.6 <gasps> by that thing. or And then a, like a 9.4 by her. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I think we all know who you're talking about anyway. It's okay. <laughs> and I just remember um, I, I was just so mad. And, and um, I remember the, uh, a couple of people that uh, right, were right there by the kiss and cry. And they said, and they, they said something about her. And they said, we know why she did that. And, you know, and, and she's like born again Christian and all this stuff. And she had just had a problem with me. And then I remember... Um, my uh, sister approaching her and asking why it's so blatant, you know what I mean? Because um, everyone booed her marks big time. And um, and Laura, Laura said, um, she said that I stood on two feet for Fosse too much. And we're like, oh, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you being known as the outrageous gay skater were in many ways, 10 years later, almost supplanted by Johnny Weir. And you've had kind of a up and down relationship, at least in the press, discussing Johnny Weir, where it didn't seem like you two always got along. What do you uh, think of Johnny now? Divas. And- we're fine now. We're fine now. You know, <laughs> friends, we have our ups and downs. We would uh, tour together and, um, you know, we pull away. Then he would go with the following year, like he would have a uh, different set of friends. And then I was like, okay. And, you know, it was just like pulling away. And I, I don't know if there's there a little competition there in, in performance wise and, and this and that. And then I took out an article and stuff and saying, you know, like I said before, uh, hopefully I open up doors for people to feel comfortable coming out, you know, and then they, they'll mention, Oh, Johnny Weir um, is, uh, yeah. And I said, well, you had to ask him, you know, maybe he should just feel comfortable with my situation just to come out of the closet. I just remember, um, my manager's like, how dare you, um, do an article like that? And I was like, what? I just telling the truth, you know? And, um, I remember going on and I guess, um, some of the people on champions nights were upset with me that I took out an article about Johnny Weir saying that he should just come out of the closet and this and that, you know, I'm like, oh my goodness. Wow. You know? I got so reprimanded for that. And it's like, and then now it's like they're celebrating his marriage to a guy, you know? Yeah, it's <laughs> like, a little bit. I'm like, wait a minute. I said, you know, I saw, um, I think Ice Network, you know, the the highlights of the year and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they had Johnny Johnny Weir and his, whatever, his marriage to a guy. I'm like, wow. And you guys reprimanded me for saying, oh, hopefully he could come out of the closet, you know? <laughs> How bizarre was it for you watching the dance that he played with the press? Because there has never really been anything like it, where Johnny was in heels and something where you were really criticized for being flamboyant, and yet you actually said you were gay, and Johnny maybe implied it or everyone assumed. Was that weird for you, where he almost it was watching I don't, that? I don't know. It's just funny because you know Johnny and I are we're fine. Yeah, we we saw each other at nationals in San Jose and stuff, and we kind of laugh or whatever. He's like, "Hi, I'm hi." You know, everything was fine. But um, it's so funny because, 
like I could be flamboyant in my skating. I was out and stuff like that. And then it's almost like they, he, Jody could show up in high heels, fur coats, red carpets, getting married to another guy. And it's, they still don't talk about him being gay. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, um, okay, fine. I won't say anything. Zip, you know, <laughs> He just married a guy, you know, he has a, the, like the shirt. It's like, oh, my boyfriend's gay. Right. I mean, or, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rudy, as we start to wrap things up, I, next week you're going to be inducted uh, at Nationals yes. in the Figure Skating Hall of Fame. And you've been nominated a couple years. You actually joked that you were like the Susan Lucci of the event, which I thought was so funny. But how does it feel to finally receive this honor? Oh, it, it's so exciting. It's just like, it's, it's the icing on the cake. It's like... I remember I just did a couple days ago that they honored me for the uh, skating club of San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And I stood on the, I, and I, you know, and I talked to some of the skaters and they're like, congratulations. And there's, there's so many good skaters out there. And, and, you know, a lot of them can win nationals and yet they may, may or may not ever be inducted to the hall of fame. And it's just like, wow, I could say that I'm in the skating U S figure skating hall of fame. Like this is like, this is in deep. This is cemented in history, you know, and it's just like, it's, it's like my Olympic gold medal. It's like, oh my God, this is like the ultimate um, achievement. And I'm so honored. It's, I'm so thrilled. I'm so excited. Something that can never be taken away from you. So yes. one of the things when Dave and I were looking over your life, I really think of you as a success story, Rudy. You're somebody who's faced adversity and you've overcome it. And I'm sure at the end of the 95 season, it must have been just emotionally and just mentally really tough for you to kind of resolve yourself to what had happened the last couple of years. And mm-hmm. I was wondering, do you have any advice for skaters? Because I'm sure there's some skaters mm-hmm. who feel exactly like you did at the end of that season, but maybe they hear oh, that right. whisper, which I'm sure you heard, which was, you know, just come back, just try one more time, no pressure. What did you learn from your comeback and what advice would you have for skaters who feel like you did at the end of that season? Well, I, I learned to um, persevere, of course, you know, um, never give up on your dream of um, finally, you know, having a, a good skate at nationals. And um, and I, the advice I give to uh, other skaters is that, you know, if it's, it's something you want, um, you just got to, um, and it's something that you love, you... you you stick with it and, you know, and if it's, if it's just still after year after year, if it's not working, then that's when you have to sit down and, and, and an ultimatum, you know, of, you know, what I want to do going to ice shows and stuff. But as long, you know, you, you've won the gold medal just by um, putting a hundred percent into it and, and persevering in the sport, you know, but it's, that's the lesson I give to the, the skaters that, you know, you follow your heart and, and, and your loved ones and the advice of others and and just follow your heart you talk about following your heart but you also said the nationals in san jose were like your olympics and not everyone gets to win their olympics but you did so how did that change your life and how did it change rudy galindo Uh, well it changed me um like my little a 15 minute stardom fame (laughs) um and just and helping you know being a role model in the gay community and in the 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 mexican-american community uh around here it was just it was nice to be a a role model and 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 speak out about that and not having the and not having the national title you know i i got to uh, by winning that title i actually go and and find out that i was hiv positive I could go and and do speaking engagements about my disease and 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 help people. And I've gotten thousands of letters and saying how I've helped them um, be themselves, coming out to their friends, coworkers, uh, families, and um, and learning to uh, live with um, being HIV positive. You know, it's not a death sentence. And um, I think that um, winning that national and that my Olympic gold medal, I. I had the uh, chance to um, voice voice myself on all those issues and help so many people. And that's just uh, all the Olympic gold medals put into one. Being inducted into the Hall of Fame, there are such a cast of characters in, in the rich history of U.S. figure skating that are in that Hall of Fame. How would you what? like to be remembered? How would you like your 
display to be in the Hall of Fame? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a good one. I mean, what can you say? You know, he was the, um, he was not the All American. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? The, the openly gay trailer trash. <laughs> Mexican, don't forget the Mexican. Oh, yeah, yeah, don't forget the Mexican. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just, I'm proud of all that, you know. And I just, I just want to be known for uh, achieving, um, um, achieving success in pairs and singles, and and being a spokesperson for the Mexican Americans and um, and HIV and AIDS. Well, I think that's so commendable, Rudy. And the last thing, we always end our interviews where we tell our skaters or our interviewees somebody's name, and then we want to hear the first thing that comes to, to your mind. And for you, Rudy, we had like two pages of names because we kept thinking of fun people that uh, made us think of you. So we pared it down to the best of the best, and we're going to start. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. Okay, the first is Tom Collins. Amazing. Nicole Bobek. Wild. Suzanne Bonali. Suzanne. <laughs> Crazy. I knew you'd like that one. <laughs> oh, lordy. <laughs> scary, 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 scary. Uh, yeah, can I change that one? Scary. Okay, yeah, yeah. Scary. Scary. <laughs> How about Saria? Um, fun. She's fun. Pasha. Diva. Diva. Philippe Candeloro. Sex Machine. He is. Uh, Elvis Stoiko. Canadian, eh? Canadian? <laughs> <laughs> He's very Canadian. I know. Uh, Elvis. Leather Pants. Oh. Dick Button. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking, Rudy? I don't know. I, you guys got me sweaty now. I'm like, <laughs> This is the part that makes you nervous. The whole interview. I'm totally sweating and like pitting out and like I was. I'm gonna pass out when you mention all these names. Like drive out. It all started out with when you said Suzanne Bonnelly. I just went, oh my god! I got all scared. I'm gonna look around the house. Do you remember Rudy on tour? I remember she would sit in the locker room, and I always remember she was like had a dictionary, and that's what she would do when we would skate. She would just highlight words, and I'd be like walking out on the ice to do my program, and she'd be asking me what these huge words meant. Yeah. Oh my god! And try to teach you yes. on the ice. I was like, I'm about to go skate. And she would, uh, I think she would bring her own rice cooker out of her skating bag and start making, did she make food in the women's dressing room? Yes. It was always just an eclectic thing that was going on. Yeah, I think just a rice cooker, a live chicken that she pulled out. <laughs> in the fridge. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know what, I, I, he's a good guy. I'm going to say Dick Button's a good guy. He is. I, that's all I could think of. <laughs> First rate. He's first rate. I think I'm dripping wet thinking of this Dan Bonnelly. I, just, <laughs> I love it. Okay. She, she scared me because I was like practicing and she was trying to teach me. I'm like, oh, no. Nah. Uh, like, well, if you want to be like nice, but uh, the, yeah, there's just nothing. Just try to yeah. invert them. Uh, okay, so what about Michelle Kwan? A lovely. She is lovely. Tara Lipinski. Um, feisty. Ooh, Brian Boitano. Brian Boitano. I see. Oh. I see. I Wisdom. Mm. He, I wisdom. He does seem very wise. All very right. Wise. And our final one, Oksana Bayul. Did I use crazy already? <laughs> <laughs> Can I, like all of them together, like fun loving crazy. <laughs> Think the good kind of crazy. Yeah. I love her. You know, it's a good kind of a good kind of crazy. <laughs> it's always the best kind. Well, thank you so much, Rudy, for spending so it, much time it, with it, us. We'd obviously like to thank Rudy Galindo for all of his time and insight today. I think he really has, you know, such a great message. I'm really taken back by the fact that Rudy, Carol, and Christy are all back together, perhaps in a different form. But I think it's absolutely wonderful that he's coaching Christy's daughter and that you can really see that this is a true friendship and a group of people who really have a love and care about one another. And I think they went through hard times as I think we've all gone through with friends and long-term people in our lives. And I think it's 
absolutely wonderful that they're back together you're supporting one another in this new chapter. I agree, Dave. I think that their relationship is one that so many of us can relate to, whether it's a friendship or a long-term relationship. You have those years where maybe things are a bit rocky, a bit dicey, but you always hope to come together in the end, and, and it seems like they've done that. I just also want to say that Rudy is somebody who has made so many people in the sport just happy. He brings you joy, whether it's through an interview or a performance on the ice. And there's no better person in my mind to be inducted to the Hall of Fame than Rudy, Gal the figure skating Hall of Fame than Rudy Galindo. And I just, I want to congratulate him again for that honor. And I would also like to thank Kevin Kwasniewski for our amazing graphics. And I'd like to thank all of you guys for tuning in and hanging with us this week. While we've been battling our boot problems, our audio and vi video problems, all these technical issues that we will get resolved in future podcasts. So thank you guys. Yes. And as always, we'd like to remind you to hold an edge and, and look, look sexy. sexy. Bye, guys. Bye.